Hi, we come to one of the most familiar stories in the entire Bible, Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. And in many ways, the Good Samaritan is a proverb, a byword in our culture. Uh, it is a form of laws, as you can see here, Good Samaritan laws that um, that protect people from liability if they help a traveler in need on the road, uh, as well as hospitals and healthcare systems named after the Good Samaritan, Samaritan Healthcare, and so many things that it seems obvious what the story is about. It's about you should um, be a good person and stop to help people who are in need on the roadside. But if the story was only about that, why do we need a Samaritan, and why the priest, and why the Levite, and why the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and why the inn, and why so many details of it? And not only that, why was I able to find, without much effort, over 30 articles written in English since the year 1998 by scholars on this passage, even though the previous passage had none that I could find in the last 20 years. So there's something about this story, and as you can see in the picture on the, on the right side of the screen from Van Gogh, uh, his uh, very stylized view of this, and we're going to look at some more images of it. The Good Samaritan as an image, as a title, and as a concept has taken hold in Western culture in deep ways. And one of the results of that is we might not be able to hear the story very well because we think we already know what it means. And that's true, I think, whether we're just ordinary people out here uh, who have never read the Bible seriously, or if you're a scholar. Because my perusing of those many articles in the last couple of decades showed that scholars are all over the place on how they understand the story and how they understand each other's versions of the story as well. And we're going to look at some of that as we go. So as we enter into this amazing passage, we're going to do just in this video an introduction. We're not going to begin to get in the story, just explore some of the issues that arise that we need to be paying attention to as we go through the story itself. So just to orient ourselves where we're at, if you haven't been watching the previous videos, we're we're in the uh, Journey to Jerusalem chiasm, and we moved into this green section here, and we'll look in a little bit at the parallel between this story and the story of the rich ruler in chapter 18, both starting with the question from them, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And we're going to be looking at that as well. We're also going to be looking at how it fits into the immediate narrative context, interestingly something that I did not find that many scholars do. They note that it's in this uh, Journey to Jerusalem uh, past section here from chapter 951 to, to 1948, um, but they don't really say much about why it matters that it's in there, and they don't say anything. I've not seen anybody who says anything about uh, how it takes place in this immediate scene. So I left out the previous verse. We're starting in verse 25 here, of course, but we're in this previous scene when Jesus had told the 70 after the return from successfully carrying out his mission, I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. And so this happens literally right in the middle of it. There's no interruption. There's no time passing. Uh, it's a, obviously a rude uh, spot there to do that. Um, the lawyer thinks that his what he has to say is more important than what Jesus has to say and that his attention is more important than the crowd who's gathered around Jesus, which we don't know how big it is, but it's at least 70 and the 12 and certainly more because he didn't send all of them out. The 70 weren't everybody. So Jesus is a big crowd around him. This lawyer interrupts him and stands up and says, answer my question. Uh, and yet uh, almost none of the articles I read uh, deals with that. So why is it they can see some things in detail and not others? Well, that's why we have multiple articles and multiple books and multiple scholars. And if you've been following my videos, I'm not under any illusion that this is the right answer to the interpretation of this passage or anything else. I'm just doing the best I can to provide perspective uh, given my research and my experience in life. So maybe others will provide other YouTube channels uh, on Luke and other things and we can uh, hear multiple views on this. So I want to take a moment just to look at some of this recent scholarship. I'm not going to go over all these, but just so you can see the range of these, and I put them in their years, and I also just said something briefly about who they were and what their perspective is. And I'll post on the webpage uh, a version of this that has the complete uh, citations of their articles in case you're interested in, in have those. But one reason I like to use these is because if you're a YouTube viewer, uh, you probably don't have access to these kinds of articles. They're hidden away uh, online or in um, journals in libraries for universities, which you can only have access to if you have institutional access, as I do as a professor emeritus. So one of the reasons I want to bring these in is to make sure that the best of this kind of work can be made available to ordinary people who can't have access to these and probably aren't interested or able to read some of these that have Greek and Hebrew in their original language of them. So I'm just going to extract some highlights, and I'm not going to go through all of these. I just want you to get a sample idea. So starting with this one that had no date, but I'm 
pretty sure it's in the late 90s, uh, a UK professor offering a political interpretation in light of conservatives like Margaret Thatcher and her perspective on selfishness. Um, and then we see another from a Kansas City professor saying the focus is not on the lawyer and his choice, but on the victim as Christ-like, as a model for others. So he sees this as the story is about the victim um, represents Jesus and how, what's your attitude toward that. Uh, then we see some that are, this is an older one, uh, not an older scholar, but an older point of view, uh, seeing the priest and the Levite uh, as representatives of Judaism and therefore ending up with an anti-Jewish perspective that really uh, rings uh, badly in our current world today. But 26 years ago, maybe things were a little different. Uh, and again, I won't go through all these, but you can see some of the different methodologies and perspectives people use, social identity theory, self-psychology theory. Um, the theorist uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, the Russian theorist, uh, and many other theories along the way. Um, some of the things that uh, may have considered to be settled uh, consensus among scholars of what's going on, some of these scholars have opened up in new ways, which I find really interesting here. Um, just uh, just a, for instance, um, we get down to the more recent ones, and Chalmers here argues that contrary to most people's view, and certainly mine as well, that the Samaritans were hated others, that, that was founded not in the Bible, but by John Calvin um, in his hostility against Catholicism, and Nazi sympathizing biblical scholars in Germany in the 30s, um, who used the, the Samaritans as a stand-in for the Jews, um, and or at least used the priests and the Levites for stand-ins for the Jews and error for those who don't follow the way of the clearly Aryan Jesus. So much of we'll see of what we think we understand about the Samaritans came from people who were had their own interests, even though that had not been recognized until relatively recently. And uh, similar things we're going to look at how in what inns are and who the priests are and who the Levites are have all been rethought and re-explored um, in recent scholarship. And that's really a, a great feast for us all. And we'll see more of that detail as we go. So our scene takes place after this opening situation. And that's something I was just noting the scholars don't pay attention to, and I want to bring it to our attention right away. You know, they tend to say, well, 1025 takes place in the travel narrative. But it takes place right after several scenes that we see here where Jesus has um, been rejected by a Samaritan village, not all Samaritans, but a Samaritan village, and refused to call down fire from heaven uh, in response to that. Then we've seen how people who want to follow Jesus have explicit or implicit excuses for why they can't quite do it yet, but would do it later, um, dealing with their social obligations. I don't want to keep that in mind because everything about our current story is about what are people's social obligations and what do they have to do with being faithful to God and the commandments in the Torah, as the lawyer brings up. Uh, and then the 70 are sent out. And as I was saying in the videos, uh, both this one and this one, perhaps in alternative to the 12, to be be a model for the 12 how to successfully do what the 12 were unable to do. They disappear from the story after these immediate scenes. But that's who Jesus is talking to uh, in our situation here when he's not simply just talking to God and offering a prayer. So that's where the attention was on the 70 and perhaps on the 12 there as well, wondering how come they could do it and we couldn't do it. And if we lost our job, will we still be important as a 12? Uh, but overall for the audience, for Luke's audience, it's about what makes for discipleship. Who are are you um, offering the presence of God and healing of God to? And in what context? And if people don't receive you, then what do you do? So I hope we can hear as we enter to the story in more detail in the next video that this is a function of um, this narrative context. And we shouldn't uh, forget that as we enter to the story. Um, but again, as another angle on why this could be challenging to hear, so much of it has seemed to be just as if it's facts. So we can look um, at Google Maps here to see the road from uh, Jericho to Jerusalem is described in the story. And as you can see, Google Maps suggests it takes almost 10 hours to cover the roughly 36 kilometers of that distance. But as you can see in this close-up picture, it's obviously not a dirt road anymore. It's a paved road with cars and buses. And at least in this image, you can see there are sharp curves like that, that if somebody was hiding behind that curve, waiting to pounce on you if you were a traveler, you might not be able to see them. And that's perhaps fit the situation of the story about being pounced on by lace uh, We'll see what the the Greek word lace means uh, in a little bit.
Uh, and then if you continue down that road closer to Jericho, what do you come across but the Good Samaritan Museum? And it shouldn't surprise us that there's a Good Samaritan Museum. There's museums and holy spots for virtually everything in the Bible that takes place anywhere within Israel. But what I find interesting here is the museum um, is built at the inn uh, that's in the story. But the story, of course, is a parable. So there's no real inn. It's not describing in Luke's Gospel that anybody was actually at a specific inn. It's just a story. Jesus is telling, but that doesn't stop folks from finding an inn and building a museum there uh, so that people can see where that happened. Of course, it only happened in the story. Um, another thing about this, although the Good Samaritan is unique um, to uh, Luke, the context uh, suggests connections with the synoptics in other ways. So we see in Mark, one of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, said, which commandment is the first? In other words, what we see in Mark, which came before Luke, we've seen how the first part of Luke's gospel follows Mark pretty directly, the question and the answer are reversed. Uh, it's the scribe who asks Jesus the question, and Jesus answers with the Shema and with Leviticus 19.8. But in our current story in Luke, Jesus says to the lawyer, what is written in the law? What do you read? And he answers with the Shema and Leviticus 19.8, just like Jesus does here. And Jesus says, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. And then the story goes on because the lawyer wants to justify himself. And that's where we get the parable. Matthew also has a version of this, but here at the Pharisees who come and ask the question, uh, having heard that he silenced the Sadducees. So, and one of them a lawyer. So the lawyer here is represented as one of the Pharisees. And this is the only use of lawyer in the, in the Gospels outside of Luke. Um, Luke, uh, Matthew usually has scribes and Pharisees, and we're going to have to look a little bit at who are, who is a lawyer, a namakos in relation to scribes or others. And, but we note that each of our evangelists uses a different setup for this conversation. And in Matthew, it just ends after that. And in Mark and Luke, there's a follow-up. Um, but they're very different. Only Luke has this story, of course. Then another thing we need to look at um, in the terms of background is, is Jesus making this story up from scratch, or is he providing a sly uh, intertextual reference to an earlier story in Scripture? And the fact that there's this story that we'll look at briefly in a moment here in Second Chronicles 28, 6 to 15 as background shouldn't surprise us that it takes the form of a parable. Because we'll see in chapter 19, when Jesus tells a story that's prefaced by the narrator to be told for those who thought as they approached Jerusalem, the kingdom of God was going to come at once about um, somebody who goes off to a distant land to get great power and comes back and delegates some of his people um, to do more with his money. And one of them takes the money and hides it and is punished for that. And that uh, story is right out of Josephus, not verbatim, but pretty much out of Josephus about how Caesar Augustus got his authority um, going to Rome, uh, or rather how Herod got his authority from Caesar Augustus going to Rome and then coming back, but being hated by his people. So we know there's already one other story, at least in Luke, and there's certainly more, where Luke is taking an anecdote uh, that would could well be known to his audience and turning it into parabolic or story form and maybe having a wink that we all know what this story is really about. Here are the parallels that we see here. So this is in, in Chronicles, which if you're not familiar, is the retelling of the monarchy story from a much later time period. And the big thrust of, of the book of Chronicles is that the Jerusalem temple is the center of the universe. It skips over many of the David stories and highlights that David built the temple, uh, or David's son Solomon rather built the temple, and that that's the key to it. And part of the perspective on Second Chron on Chronicles, like the perspective on in the book of Kings that we'll We'll look at a little later when we look at the Samaritans in more detail, is that Jerusalem is the center and Israel in the north with its capital in Samaria uh, is at best uh, a temporary expedient because Judah has uh, not uh, not behaved well or Judah's kings have not behaved well and God has allowed the rebellion, allowed Israel to exist. But the overall thrust of the books of kings and the larger Deuteronomistic history that it's a part of, which is to say Deuteronomy through 2 Kings, including Joshua and Judges and the books of Samuel, as well as the later revision in 2 Chronicles makes Jerusalem the center. And so it's interesting in light of that that we see this scene where a, a warrior from the tribe of Ephraim, which is also often a synonym for Israel uh, in the books of Kings and in the prophets as well, um, attack Judah. And they're described as the people of Israel taking 200,000 of their kin, which is, say, Judahites, captive, and brought the booty to Samaria. 
But a prophet there named Odon went out to meet them and warned them that Yahweh was angry with Judah and gave them into your hand. But if you bring these captives into the town, you'll bring Yahweh's wrath down on us. And then there's several chiefs of the Ephraimites named here who stood up and sighed uh, with the prophet and say, you shall not bring the captives in here for you propose to bring on us guilt against Yahweh in addition to our present sins and guilt. So the warriors left the captives and the booty before the officials and all the assembly. Then we hear those who were mentioned by name, which is to say these people here, got up and took the captives and with the booty they clothed all that were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink and anointed them, and carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys, brought them to their kindred at Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then they returned to Samaria. And of course we can see the similarities not only of Jericho and Samaria as reference points, but about the carrying for people who've been left uh, naked along the roadside there. Um, so Luke may well have this story of good Samaritans who are also Israelites in the background as he goes. So in light of uh, all those questions raised by scholarship, I want to bring up this little chart here that we'll look at throughout as we go. Characters and characteristics in Luke 10, 25 to 37. And I'm framing this around this question. What do you think you know about each of these characters in their own cultural context within the framework of Luke's gospel? And if your answer is, I don't know anything, that's wonderful. Because if you don't know anything, you're a blank slate and the, the work of recent scholarship can write on you uh, what we know uh, better than what we knew or thought we knew decades ago. But if you think you know some things, I encourage you to hold those lightly to see whether the evidence that we will uh, present and the evidence that scholars present really um, is fitting with what your presupposition is. So let's go over these and just raise some of the questions. So there's Jesus. Do we know who Jesus is? Well, we'll find out more. Um, who he's talking to here, notice just then the lawyer stood up and we don't ever hear in the story from anybody else other than the lawyer. But all these people are there, aren't they? At least the 70, because he was directly talking to them. But how big a crowd is it? We don't know. What do they think of this scene? We don't know. Then we get the lawyer, Anamakos, and we see lawyers only a couple other times in Luke and only in that Matthew passage that I mentioned, only elsewhere in the Gospels. So whatever we can know about people known as Namakoi, it's going to have to come from something else than the context of our text because we just don't have enough. Then we get to the interesting question of neighbor, and I put it in brackets because, of course, there is no neighbor in the story. There's just the idea of neighbor, and it's only in this passage in Luke, following the language of Placeon from Leviticus 19.8, but there's two other words that are translated in the New Arise Standard, which is what my version of it is here, as neighbor. Giton here is neighbor in a couple of other places, and only one other time in the New Testament. And, and perioikeo as neighbor back in 165, which literally just means the people that live near you. So that might not be the same thing as we'll see where placeon or gaton might mean not just somebody who happens to live next to you, you don't know, but somebody who's part of your group in whatever way group might apply. So we'll look at the importance of that and why it matters what the Greek word is here and what the idea is of neighbor in terms of what the answer to the lawyer's question is. Um, and so then we have a naked, half-dead man on the Jerusalem-Jericho Road. And I've already shown you the road, but we don't know anything about this person. In fact, we don't even immediately know he's a man. The text says an anthropos, um, which is to say a human being, but then uses male pronouns. Um, and it's really hard to imagine that a woman would be alone on, on that road. Um, although Luke already had Mary alone on the road all the way from Galilee to the hills of Judea to go visit her kinswoman Elizabeth. So there are exceptions, aren't there? Um, I note that he's half dead because a number of scholars seem to make the obvious mistake of noting, suggesting that the priest and Levite couldn't touch him because there's laws against touching a dead person. But he's not dead. That's the point. And um, they'd be able to visibly see he wasn't dead because he's certainly breathing and they would be able to find that out without touching him. So um, that's just a mistaken reading on some scholars part. Then we get to the question of robbers or bandits, translating the Greek leistes. And as we'll see, this may or may not be a negative view. Some scholars start immediately saying the robbers are the bad guys and obviously sending upon someone and stripping them naked is not a positive act. But lay stakes, as people like Richard Horsley have pointed out for decades now, may well be what he calls social bandits in the sense of being like a Robin Hood. 
in stealing from the rich to give to the poor. And there would be many wealthy pilgrims on the road down from Jerusalem to uh, to Jericho. And it may well be that these people are, are trying to rob them to help out their neighbors who are um, not doing well because of the corruption of the Jerusalem elite, the very people that Jesus has often challenged like the prophets before him. So we're going to need to look more closely at who they are. And then priests and Levites might seem obvious, um, but curiously, they're not at all obvious. Priests are in, in um, Luke's gospel a few times, and Levites only here in um, Luke, and only once in Acts, and only one other time in the entire New Testament. Um, when priests and Levites from Jerusalem are, were sent to ask John the Baptist um, who he was and what he was doing. And as scholars have pointed out, one of my articles we'll get back to when we get to the priests and Levites, um, the question of who was a priest or who was a Levite was greatly contested because there are multiple stories of origin in the Hebrew Bible about what makes somebody a priest or what makes somebody a Levite. And I won't go into that now, but to highlight the fact that the narrator tells us, or actually Jesus tells us, um, that there's a priest or a Levite, we don't know how secure they might be in relation to each other or in relation to their fellow priests and Levites. So we'll have to look at that some more too. And of course, the key question is the Samaritan. And we've already saw a Samaritan in 952, at least implicitly. We saw a Samaritan village that refused to welcome uh, the 12 because they were had their because Jesus had his face set for Jerusalem. And that's a key point here. So we'll need to ask, what is a Samaritan doing on the Jerusalem-Jericho Road if their temple is Mount Gerizim uh, in, there in Samaria? Samaria and not Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And we'll see one more Samaritan later, so we have a little more data here. One of the ten lepers that Jesus heals is a Samaritan. And then we'll see Samaritans in Acts when um, Philip uh, and the Ethiopian eunuch are in that context, and we'll see that um, the, the apostles were told right from the beginning to take the message from Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So Samaria is in view uh, in Luke's understanding of where the Gospels to go. And it's only in John 4, the story of the Jesus and the Samaritan woman, and one other time in the New Testament. So we don't know a lot about Samaritans from the New Testament, but we know more about them from Hebrew Scripture and other texts, as we'll see. Then there's an inn. And curiously, there's two different words for inn in Luke. Um, Pandokion, as we see, only here in the New Testament, but elsewhere it's Cataluma. So where Mary and Joseph are in that famous story of Jesus' birth is a Cataluma, and we'll see a Cataluma here, which is described as the guest room. This is the so-called upper room where they have the Last Supper. Might you have thought of that as the same kind of place where Mary and Joseph were staying, which you usually think of as a stable, um, but they're both the word Cataluma. But both of those are different from Pandokion and the innkeeper Pandokai, only here in the New Testament. Um, and what's interesting about these is scholars have tended to say in the past that inns were places of disrepute, especially commercial inns, and this is plainly a commercial situation, since uh, the Samaritan gives the innkeeper a couple of denarii and says when he returns he'll give him more money if it's if it's spent. So whether commercial inns were places of disrepute or not um, may or may not be the case, and we'll have to explore that more as we go. So, so many questions to really be able to enter into the story and hear it on its own terms. Well, I want to highlight that that's what we're doing here. We're taking a journey into a place that's foreign to us, regardless of where you're watching this or listening to this video from. Me in the Seattle area, or you somewhere else on in the world, we're not in Samaria, we're not on the Jerusalem Jericho Road, and we're not 2,000 years ago. For whatever things we might think now uh, may be very different than uh, what we discover when we go through the story. So as we conclude, let's just look at a couple of more ways that artists have portrayed the scene so we can see how their perspective shows something of the emotional and um, interrelational dynamics of the story. So the oldest one of our set here is Van, Van Harlem, and I really like this one because it starkly shows you the man's nakedness and vulnerability. And as some scholars have suggested, it would show whether he was circumcised or not too, or whether he was a Jew, if that's relevant to any of the people that come along. Then we see one of a couple of images that Rembrandt's done of this painting, this one from 1638. And I like this one because it shows it in the wider context. It shows how small they are in relation to the, the greater scene around them and the darkness of it. Uh, I like this one from James Tisso from two centuries later um, because it, it shows the rawness of the earth rather than present the world around like the world of the artist. It really tries to show that this would be a rough earth and to be left on the ground there would really leave you in a dry, dead-looking place and in need of help. 
Uh, and then uh, one last time, the one from God, Van Gogh that we saw earlier, and it's not the only one that Van Gogh has done. Van Gogh who does not do very many biblical scenes, but here we see that there. So with those images in mind, um, I hope you'll take a deep breath and our next video will begin to enter into this wonderful story. See you for that next time. Bye-bye.